Good evening, everyone. Um, I thank a very big welcome to our SCVO uh, hustings. Um, we're really delighted to have all the leaders of all the main parties um, in Scotland with us tonight. Um, and also really excited to have uh, over 200 people registered for this event. So um, a, a great source of interest, I, I'm sure, across the sector. Um, we have had 80 questions submitted in advance, but we obviously won't be able to cover all of those questions, but they've, they've covered some main themes. So that's what will be being picked up by, by Brian and, um, and the party leaders as, as we pick up, um, uh, as we go through the, the evening. A little bit of housekeeping, the um, chat function has been disabled, but please feel free to use Twitter um, and uh, engage in the event on social media. It's hashtag SCVO Hustings. Um, and the session is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel um, to look at again um, after the event. So I'm going to disappear now and hand over to, thankfully, a professional host. I'm extremely relieved that uh, we have a professional in the chair tonight for, us, for a very important occasion for us. So um, I'm going to hand over now to Brian Taylor, who we're absolutely delighted um, has agreed to host this event for us. Thank you, Brian. And um, everybody, I hope you enjoy it. Anna, thanks very much. It's very kind of you to, to welcome us in, in that fashion. And thanks too for setting out the terms that the voluntary sector is critically important in Scotland, not least during this hideous plague, this dreadful pandemic, and of course in its aftermath, and that's one of the questions I'm delighted to say we'll be taking later in the evening. I think the, the extent of the importance of the voluntary sector is, is rightly reflected in the fact that we have the top team tonight. We have the leaders of all five main parties. We have them all here tonight, and I'm delighted to welcome each of them, and I'll welcome them now in turn. The format is that they'll set out their, their stall in an, a, a brief uh, opening address with them posing questions. I'd like to take all 80, but we've got it down to three, three questions that attracted a lot of support from a range of organizations. And we'll, so we'll take those and, and put them to, the, to the, the, the panel, to the leaders and get a bit of discourse going. And then, of course, we'll allow them a, a closing remark in the, uh, the, the, the order in which they opened as well. So let's get started. No, no further ado. Let's not muck about anymore. Let's get started. And our first speaker tonight, delighted to welcome Patrick Harvey from the Greens. Patrick, please. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. And thanks to SCVO for the invitation. Uh, unlike the others, I'm, of course, co-leader. Uh, so I'll, I'm happily uh, sharing these opportunities with my, my colleague Lorna Slater throughout the, the campaign. Uh, I think some people uh, know that uh, I used to work in the voluntary sector before I was in Parliament. I, I worked within a, an HIV agency in Glasgow and I, I know how deeply frustrating it is to be spending uh, a third of your time applying for funds, you know, applications for grants, a third of your time evaluating the last bunch of uh, grant applications uh, and having not enough time left to do the actual job uh, that, that you're about. So I understand that frustration and I know that we're going to be discussing uh, issues around financial stability for the sector later on. But I'm also completely convinced that far more can be delivered by the voluntary sector than is happening now, if only we give it the support that it needs. Uh, a huge amount of change is required in our society whether we're talking about how we shape the COVID recovery, uh, how we ensure that it's a green recovery and invest in things like sustainable jobs, renewable energy, warm homes, public transport, uh, and restoring nature, uh, how we close the poverty and inequality gaps, uh, and how we address the climate and nature emergencies. These are phenomenal areas of change in our society. Uh, and just as the green movement has always known, uh, and as I've known since my mum set up a a community recycling project when I was about six or seven years old and had me out in the, the back of a van hurling around bundles of newspaper at the weekend. The Green Movement knows that the voluntary sector can give leadership, not just doing uh, the bidding of the state, but can give leadership to the change that's required in our society. I'm really looking forward to your questions, and I know Brian doesn't want us to go over time in these introductions, so I'll leave it there. Patrick, thank you very much indeed for that serious message, but also for that information about your very tough paper round that you had as a wee one. Thanks for that. That was uh, great. Let's welcome next Willie Rennie from the Liberal Democrats. Willie, please. Uh, thanks very much, Brian, and thanks, STVO. Uh, by now, you'll have heard probably all the party slogans. Ours is uh, put recovery first. In short, it's about putting the divisions of recent years behind us to work together to utilise the skills, the talents of everyone in the country to recover from this dreadful pandemic. 
that will enable us to cut mental health rates, get bounce back support for education, create jobs and take action on the climate. Now, the philosophy of Liberals and Liberal Democrats now is to firmly rooted in the community action, volunteering and local empowerment. By our nature, we are suspicious of big government, especially when it hoards power and instinctively believe in strong communities. A vibrant third sector leading communities, giving a voice to the powerless, threading a fabric in our communities is a mark of a civilised society. A visit to a main shed in St Andrews has stuck with me for some time. A mixture of professors and men who had worked with their hands all of their life got together regularly to build things like garden furniture. What was even more important was the coffee break around a colossal table. They openly shared their mental health issues, something they had never done before joining the men's shed. For me, that's the power of communities volunteering in the third sector in action. It's the role of government to nurture the sector, not control it. The third sector is not a creature of government and it must never be. It needs the freedom to act, to criticise and to challenge. Scotland does have a third sector to be proud of, from the work on the government, on the environment, to drug misuse, to poverty, to homelessness, to education and health. I have to say it's impressive work. Thank you, Brian. Really, thanks very much indeed. Good to hear an anecdote there from the old great tune of St Andrews. Now, let's hear, I'm delighted to welcome Douglas Ross from the Conservatives. Douglas, please. Thanks very much, Brian, and, and thanks to everyone attending tonight and for Anna and the team at SCVO for organising tonight's event. I think the numbers uh, coming along show that there's a great interest in this election from the voluntary organisations, large and small. And what we've seen over the last 12 months is uh, SCVO and many others uh, going above and beyond. We've seen it in communities up and down the country, and I think it has reinforced the strong and powerful message uh, that voluntary organisations do and continue to do in our communities right across Scotland. Scottish Conservatives have set out five key pledges for this election. We want to see 3,000 additional teachers recruited over the next Parliament, £2 billion extra invested in our NHS. We want to see full fibre broadband rolled out by 2027. We want to see more police on our streets, making communities safer. And we want to introduce retraining to rebuild grants of £500 for everyone in the country to get people back into work if they sadly lose their job. Uh, as a result of this pandemic and the uh, difficult economic times we're all going to be facing. But we also want to see and continue to support a strong, vibrant voluntary organisations right up and down the country. Uh, and I think as we reflect today on a, a very grim statistic of the number of lives sadly lost in Scotland as a result of COVID-19, now over 10,000 people and, and families who have been broken by that news, we also have to look at some of the very small positives from this pandemic, and that has been the way people have worked together, have come together uh, have built up bonds that weren't there before COVID-19 and I really hope continue after COVID-19. So I want to take that positive message to the people of Scotland over the next few weeks uh, and all of this can only be done in partnership with, with everyone on this call. Our vibrant voluntary sector who know the needs of our communities, serve them daily and are absolutely committed to a brighter future for everyone we work with. Thanks, Brian. Douglas, thank you. Douglas, thank you very much indeed and, and you're entirely right to mention that that grim mortality rate, of course, that'll feature in our first question before that. Uh, delighted to welcome Anna Sawar from the Labour Party. Anna, please. Thank you, Brian. And, and as you said, it, it's a mark of how much um, we all respect and rely on the voluntary sector that all the leaders of the political parties are here. But even more so, Brian Taylor's come out of re retirement, especially <laughs> uh, to host this session with us today. That shows you how important uh, the voluntary sector is as well. Uh, look, the last year has been really tough for all of us. Uh, there's, there's no point in pretending otherwise. It, but actually, even though it's pulled us apart from our loved ones, we've actually come together as a country like never before. Um, and the voluntary sector is a perfect example of that. Um, if you look at all the challenges we face, particularly in the first lockdown and since, uh, you saw the voluntary sector coming and rallying around communities, helping you know, neighbours get their, um, their shopping, um, helping those that needed that extra bit of support, taking up some caring responsibilities sometimes for people uh, as well, giving support, continued support to, for example, cancer patients through the uh, pandemic, all the voluntary sector support around mental health services, uh, you know, all the volunteer teachers around there doing one-to-one -one tutoring uh, online when the schools were off, a remarkable, remarkable effort uh, by the voluntary sector. Um, and we've got to recognize that role coming out of this pandemic and make sure they're a key part um, of our recovery. We should also recognize though that you've taken a massive hit in terms of, of course, lives lost. We've all been impacted 
by this pandemic, but also in, in terms of furlough. I know from so many people that work in and around the voluntary sector, their own nervousness uh, about the sustainability of the sector, the sustainability of, of individual charities, uh, what that means for those that have been uh, on furlough. You've not had access to fundraising or fundraising events like you've had pr in previous years because of the impact uh, of the pandemic. And therefore, that's what I want us to focus on. I want us to focus on what unites us as a country, not what divides us. I want us to unite around a recovery plan. And if we're honest, that recovery plan is only going to work if it is seen as being a direct partnership between the public sector, the voluntary sector and the private sector. So we can get people back to work and we can save businesses, create new businesses, create a new economy for the future, a green economy for the future, new tech jobs for the future and create employment through it as well. It means having thriving public services. And those thriving public services is yes, again, in the public sector, but how we deliver those public services uh, through partnership with the, with the voluntary sector uh, is also going to be really important. And, you know, as we get young people back into work, particularly around our jobs guarantee scheme and the long term unemployed back to work, again, that's got to be a key partnership with the voluntary sector, the private sector uh, and the public sector as well. So sustainability is really important to all of you. I completely understand that. I know there's a question later on uh, about sustainability. Public service, really important to all of you. Policy drive, really important to all of you. How we deliver effective public services in partnership with the voluntary sector, really important to all of you. Um, and these are all conversations I look forward uh, to having with you over the course of this evening uh, and beyond, uh, because we can only be serious about coming through this as a stronger and fairer nation if we see this as that collective partnership with our voluntary sector organisations and much more across the country. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, uh, to, to open our event this evening, delighted to welcome First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, the leader of the SNP. Nicola, please. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, thanks to all of my fellow leaders as well. Um, in the dark, distant past, I also used to work in the third sector in Drum Chapel Law and Money Advice mm -hmm. Centre. But of course, that was uh, a bit longer ago than Patrick's experience of, of working in the third sector. But back then, that gave me an insight that has stayed with me right throughout my time in politics and particularly my time in government. Uh, let me start with a big thank you to Anna and the SCVO team, not just for tonight, but for being such an important partner at all times, but particularly through the past 12 months. And also a massive thank you to the sector more widely. Over the past year, we've seen hundreds of organisations and literally thousands of volunteers help the country through the pandemic. And, you know, whether that's been delivering food and medicines, you know, helping combat loneliness, providing physically distanced activities for kids, helping people with mental health challenges, we would not have got through without that contribution. So I just want to say a big thank you. Uh, looking ahead as we start hopefully to rebuild and recover from the pandemic, there are three things uh, that I would highlight briefly and will come on, I'm sure, to all of them this evening. First is secure and stable funding uh, and also support for the sector to adapt and become more sustainable for the long term. Uh, secondly, it's about how we support the sector and the many organisations that make up the sector do more and work towards parity of esteem with government and with the statutory sector, because I think the third sector is often the best place to know in terms of decision making and service provision what is required. And thirdly, it's about harnessing uh, the, the voice and the leadership of the sector as we look towards the really big challenges that we face as a country, recovery from the pandemic, tackling climate change, tackling inequalities. Uh, the strength and the diversity of the voices across the sector are crucial in that. So it is about leadership, it's about listening, and it's about learning from the sector as we face up to these big challenges for the future. So I'm sure we'll get into all of that and more this evening, but I want to end where I started with a big thank you and say how much I look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. First of all, thanks, and a thanks from me to the CVO as well, and thanks to this tremendous audience tonight. You know, more than 200, I gather, upwards towards 250. Let's go straight to the questions. Remember that hashtag SCVO Hustings if you want to take part in the chat. But the question, first question comes from, among many, many others who put their name to it, comes from Trusteeship Matters. Uh, the question is this, what have you learned about the voluntary sector through the recent COVID pandemic? And what does this tell you about the role the sector plays in our society and will play in the recovery from the pandemic? That, that closing bit there particularly important. I'm gonna to go to Willie Rennie here on that one. Willie, what, what do you make of that question? Role of the voluntary sector in the pandemic? I mean, it has been, it's been agile. 
it's been essential. The way that it's managed to to respond quickly, you know, to be fair, as government did, um, is, was impressive. Um, the, to be able to utilise the host of new volunteers, some of who have never volunteered in their life before, um, doing the practical things of collecting shopping and prescriptions and making sure people were okay, they weren't isolated, all that stuff was great. We all know that. Um, the, the challenge now is how do we make sure we capture those people that continue, so they continue to be involved in the voluntary sector on a sustainable basis? Because often people come together on a crisis, but how do you keep them together on a longer term? So we need to have the networks to be able to train those people to make sure that they're involved, they're involved in the processes, and that they become part of the organisation and permanent volunteers. Um, so they become expert volunteers. So we need organisations that have got um, additional funds to be able to do that. Um, the sector I worry about most is, is the kind of the um, youth sports, youth activity groups that have by and large been inactive over the last year, apart from on some occasions remote and then for short periods in person. And they have struggled for years to get enough volunteers to be able to sustain those organisations. Uh -huh. So we need to make sure that we've got the right support in place to help those organisations evolve. Because once you lose volunteers, it's difficult to get them back. So I think we need to recognise that it's not every part of the voluntary sector that's been active throughout all of this, and some of it has been redundant. So I want to make sure we've got the proper support in place to help them to evolve, as well as capture the new people that have come on board. Well, thanks for that. Of course, the, the voluntary sector working with people who've been badly hit by the pandemic, but the sector itself hit 56% uh, reporting lost income from fundraising, 90% uh, of charities reporting a negative impact upon their ability to deliver services. A really difficult set of circumstances. Nicholas Sturgeon, First Minister, a really difficult set of circumstances for the people that the voluntary sector are, are helping, but also for the sector itself. Undoubtedly. I mean, the question is, what have I learned about the sector through the pandemic? Um, I think what I learned about the sector back in the days when I was health secretary, responsible for one of the biggest statutory agencies in the country, uh, has been reinforced for me throughout the pandemic. So the sector is adaptable, responsive, flexible, um, and also tends to know its service users better than any statutory agency does. So it can uh, better uh, work out and respond to what the people who rely on their uh, particular organisation services want, need, and how best to deliver and reach uh, those. So that's what we've got to, to utilise. The, the, the third sector does a wonderful job in so many different ways in Scotland, but we do underutilise, and often uh, the statu statutory agencies will go to the third sector to fill gaps, and I think we need to uh, turn around how we approach that and, and almost a third sector voluntary sector first approach because often they're they're best placed uh, but the pandemic's also underlined the fragilities fragilities in terms of of funding and we'll come on to that more centrally later on fragilities in terms of by the very nature of often being uh, dependent on volunteers i think one of the big things we should repeat which we did at the start of the pandemic as we come out of the pandemic is a big volunteering drive encouraging people to come and volunteer and also lastly recognizing we talk about the third sector as if it is one homogenous group the diversity of the third sector yes. is is enormous in itself. So we have to look at, there'll be parts of the third sector that have coped better than others, and there will be parts that are, are much, much more fragile. So our response has to cater for that and take account of that. Nicola, thanks very, very much for that. Patrick Harvey, please, from the Greens. Patrick, your, your, your comment on this, this question. Role of the voluntary sector in the pandemic and beyond. Well, I mean, I agree with a lot of what's been said, and I suspect this is the kind of question which will elicit quite a lot of agreement across the political parties. Uh, you know, issues like resilience, issues like adaptability and flexibility, uh, and decentralisation as well. Um, you know, there are obviously big organisations within the third sector, but even they tend to keep authority decentralized within themselves. They, they tend not to be big bureaucracies. So there's there's something really important about that. Um, I think it's really, there's a danger in this question that we're all just going to say, they'll kind of give an answer that's a variant on, isn't the third sector wonderful? Well done, everybody. And I, I think we need to recognise that there are, there are other lessons. I think 
one of the things I've learned during the pandemic is that I wish a hell of a lot more of our economy was being run on a non-profit basis. Uh, if I look at the appalling, abysmal treatment of asylum seekers in Glasgow in terms of the, the housing provided by big profit-seeking organisations hired by the Home Office, I wish to goodness our third sector was running uh, that, those services uh, and running them on a standard that we could be proud of rather than a standard that we could be ashamed of. When I look at the, the impact of the, the wider private rented sector, for example, and the way that the letting agencies uh, have bullied people uh, out of flats, have continued to uh, continue to do things like illegal fees and charges. I wish to goodness that the third sector was running a lot more of our economy. Uh, and you know the the challenges of a resilient society, the challenges of, of building a resilient society, because we know COVID is not going to be the the last crisis that we have to face, whether because of climate change uh, or other factors, we're going to have more crises to face. And a society where so many people are living in precarious housing with precarious incomes is not strong and resilient. So we need to be looking at how we can run much more of our economy and our society on a non-profit basis, because fundamentally capitalism is the system that has brought us to the brink of crisis and it is not where the solutions lie for the future. Thanks very much for that, Douglas Ross. Uh, on, on the question itself, but you may want to pick up that on that point about the the, the capitalist system and about the, the role of the Home Office with regard to refugees, your call, but you, the, the main question as well. Uh, well, I do think we do have consensus in this issue, and I want to pick up on something that, that Nicola Sturgeon said, is just how diverse this sector is. If we look at the attendees on this call tonight who will be helping people in financial distress or with loneliness or in a mental health crisis, uh, the organisations that look to tackle the climate emergency, those who support people uh, who suffer from domestic abuse, I mean, the list is endless of the role of voluntary organisations and the sector uh, across Scotland. And to go to both the SART and the end of the question. First of all, what have I learned? Well, I wouldn't say so much learned, but what has been reiterated to me throughout this is regardless of how much the circumstances have shifted, and no, none of us could have imagined what the country was going to go through even this time 12 months ago. And that huge shift in everything that was affecting people and the greater demands on voluntary organisations the support was still there. It was difficult. The figures you suggested, uh, Brian, 90% uh, of organisations have struggled to provide that support, but always when it was needed, the support was there because of the commitment and the dedication of the people on this call and volunteers right across the country. And then how do we look at how the voluntary organisations can play a role in our recovery? Well, I think when you give people the opportunity to serve one another, and I signed up as a volunteer at the start of this pandemic, and you know I also volunteered at a vaccination centre uh, a few weeks ago as well. When you give people the opportunity to help one another, to work with one another, to act together, I really think that's something we can tap into. We can't lose that coming out of this pandemic because it was one of the few good things within the pandemic, and that will lead our recovery as we unite and work together coming out of the most difficult 12 months we've been through. Douglas, thanks very much indeed. But generically, what about Patrick Harvey's point that he's saying that it is the current structure of funding and finance through the capitalist system that is landing people in trouble in the first place and requiring the, the voluntary sector to pick up the pieces? So, so to try and keep it as consensual as possible, indeed. I would politely dis disagree with Patrick on that. We come at this from a different angle, but I think we both acknowledge... I'm actually relieved to hear it. I'm um, actually relieved to hear it that Douglas is disagreeing. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, we both acknowledge and support the massive role of the voluntary sector as well. Uh, Anna Salwar, please. Thank you. No, I, I'll just pick up where, where Patrick was talking about. I think Patrick's right about, right about uh, not-for-profits and the role they can play in the wider economy. I think he's right about delivery of, of vital public services. But, but there's also a, a third part, which is I think the pandemic really, really exposed again how you know, voluntary sector organisations have a relationship with the communities they serve and are able to reach places that government will never be able to reach, whether that's central government or local government will never be able to reach. And I think that's a real lesson for us in terms of how we support our partnership with the voluntary sector going forward. I think it's also worth noting that you know, we couldn't have got to where we got to now at this stage of the pandemic if it wasn't for the voluntary sector. You know, the, the speed in which the voluntary sector reacted to the pandemic I think has to be recognised. So at the same time as you know, staffing told to go home and work, at the same time as going into lockdown, the same time where sometimes charity premises were closing or offices were closing, and at the same time some staff were being put on furlough, they were still able to mobilise as organisations to reach out 
um, and support communities across the country. And that should be a source of inspiration to us all about how we can rapidly change it and do things. You, you mentioned one of the stats, Brian, about the 90% yeah. of charities impacted. You know, you're, you're a third saying they had a disruption in terms of the, the, the ability to deliver their service to their beneficiaries. 77% of organizations had to change the way it delivered those services. 37% of people saying that they weren't able to volunteer or unable to work the way that they normally would um, as a charity volunteer. So huge challenges for the sector um, through the pandemic, but they've gone above and beyond to actually deliver. So just like we thank our other frontline NHS staff and social care staff and police officers and local government workers, I think we've also got to recognize those that on the front line through our voluntary sector that have been uh, supporting people as well. In terms of the role of voluntary sector yes. needs to going forward, um, the national recovery, you know, we all, we've all learned to talk about the recovery uh, and the national recovery. Uh, and I think when you look at each part of that national recovery, there is a key role for the voluntary sector to play. So whether it's a jobs recovery, if we are going to make sure we get people back to work, either the long-term unemployed back to work or young people back to work, there are not going to be enough jobs just available in the private sector to make that happen. We have to encourage more roles in the public sector and the voluntary sector as well. If you talk about the climate recovery, we're only going to achieve our, our aspirations around net zero, around you know building the quality homes that are carbon neutral, about all the things we want to do in our individual communities if we see that as a relationship with the voluntary sector um, as well. Community safety and all the services we want to deliver in our communities, again, we can only do that if we see that as a partnership with voluntary sector organizations that can reach into those individual communities. I could say the same with education delivery. I could say the same with, with in terms of our NHS. If you look at our NHS and social care system, yeah. if you did not have the support from the voluntary sector supplementing what we do directly from our social care sector and our NHS, we could not do the breadth of support we need around our medical services across the country as well. These are all things that we have to see as a direct partnership with the voluntary sector. Anna, thanks very much indeed. Nicola Sturgeon, I saw you trying to get back in. Was that right, yeah? Yeah, I mean, we talk and we all do this. Um, we talk about the voluntary sector, the, the statutory sector, you know, the, the private sector, the public sector and the private sector, as if they're, they're distinct groups that you know are kind of fixed in, in their role in society. If we want to grow the voluntary sector the third sector it is about the public sector the traditional public sector doing less of what it currently does and allowing the voluntary sector to do more but where patrick is right is that it is also about it looking at things that we have allowed to be done by the private sector and asking ourselves whether the voluntary sector can do it better and you know where i might slightly disagree although i probably tend more to patrick's view, i definitely tend more to patrick's view than douglas's on this but maybe we shouldn't uh, you know, immediately allow that to become a bit of a sloganizing war between the fall of capitalism or, or not. We should actually engage in this properly. There are big things right now that the private sector does that the voluntary sector would be able to do better. We've got a thriving social enterprise uh, sector in Scotland and we should be looking to grow that. So as we talk about the different sectors, let's not assume that their boundaries are fixed. We should absolutely challenge those boundaries and actually look at how we grow at what the, the third sector overall does. And that will be about you know, creeping into the, the current realms of both the public and the private sector. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, Doug, Douglas Ross, does the private sector need to shrink to, to create room for the, the, the third sector? Does the public sector need to shrink perhaps to create room at some points for the, for the third sector? I think that's the, the, the really important issue here is I, I don't think anyone, Patrick, Nicola, or anyone is suggesting this is something that could happen overnight. You know, it would be a long term process, but it is something we should always look at. You know, who delivers the best possible service? In some cases, it's the private sector. In some cases, it's the public sector. And there will be cases where that's the voluntary sector. But we can't assume that right now we can just flick a switch. And I don't think anyone is suggesting that. It would certainly be a long term approach to take. But, you know, we've always got to look at what delivers the best outcome. For just come, come, come straight back in, Nicola Sturgeon. I see Nicola Sturgeon then back so, so Some of this is about a longer term transition, but actually there is some of it that you could do very quickly. The example that was used earlier on about the Home Office and the housing of asylum seekers, that is a policy decision that could very, very quickly be changed. And it's about what we value. Why does a government allow uh, pretty, at times, disreputable private sector practices to look after our asylum seekers? Because they don't value enough uh, what it is that they're providing. So some of it, yes, you're right, is a long-term transition to change the shape of these things, but don't let that uh, blind us to where things could be done much more quickly. And there'll be areas where the Scottish Government as well should be challenged uh, on that uh, front too. Thanks for that. Briefly, uh, Douglas Ross, and then to Patrick Harvey. Yeah, I was just going to ask uh, Nicola Sturgeon, you know, just maybe one example, you've highlighted an issue that Westminster could use the voluntary sector instead of the private sector. What would be an example for the Scottish Government? What could you do? Oh. 
actually the other one that Patrick just talked about there, the private rented sector, one of the things we have uh, in our own manifesto, and I'm sure the other parties will reflect this, is the need to further reform the private rented sector. We've given a commitment to bringing forward a housing bill. Maybe as part of that, we need to look at the role of the, the third sector. In my previous ministerial responsibility, which is still my responsibility as First Minister, there's, there's lots that the health service currently does um, that would be better done by the voluntary sector. So this is not just about pointing the finger at others. It's absolutely about all of us taking this responsibility, but it involves all of us to be open minded to that. Thanks for that. Patrick Harvey, then Willie Rennie, then Anna Sobel. Yeah, and if you're if you're looking for other examples, I would I would add the food system as well. We've got a food system that is massively dominated by a tiny number of giant retailers, and it distorts uh, both the social and the environmental impact uh, of the food system. But look, the the point about whether this is just flicking a switch. Of course, it's not just flicking a switch and saying suddenly the economy is different overnight. But the danger is if we don't take uh, bold steps in this direction uh, as fast as we can, then when a crisis comes along, it'll be the private sector that fails. When the private sector fails, they've already extracted their profit, banked it in a tax haven, and they will leave people high and dry. When we're looking at the kind of crises that our society may face as a result of the climate emergency and the breakdown of our natural world, we cannot rely on the private sector because when the crisis comes along, they will flip the switch and leave people uh, without the, the the basic essentials of life. So Patrick, we need to make sure we're them in the public interest first. Patrick Harvey, thanks for that. Willie Rennie, then Anna Sower. The government has got tremendous power on this because it's got a massive procurement budget that has been tried to be reformed in recent years, but just results in actually sometimes big companies winning a lot of the contracts because they can bid to the lowest price. What we need to get to is government trying to shape so they can direct those funds towards local community organisations, local businesses that can actually create a much more vibrant sector. Now, sometimes that rubs up against efficiency and price, but often government looks to efficiency and price when it needs to look to the longer term to create bodies that are much more sustainable, locally rooted, and therefore can contribute much more back to the local community. But when often government faces that choice, it chooses price over actually long-term savings and long-term benefits for the community. Thank you, Thank you for that. And, and Anna Sawa, then I'm going to move on to the next question. Anna Sawa from Labour, please. We'll, we'll come on to long-term sustainability in, in, a, in a moment, I'm sure, Brian, but I think, I think it has to be looked at as a partnership. So there, there is so much more that we can deliver in our local communities if, it, if it's voluntary sector delivering it rather than private sector, but also, yeah. as Nicola Sturgeon has said, voluntary sector delivering it rather than the public sector and, and our NHS and social care services are actually a very, very good example of that, where we do have reach and an ability to reach in. And also, I mean, the, the Home Office is another good example, well, a bad example, but a good example, if you know what I mean, about where we can actually deliver local services in a way that are either not for profit or done in a way that has reach in our individual communities. And I think we just need to think outside the box. We should not be ideological about this. We should be delivering these services the best way possible, the most efficiently way possible. Because if you're a voluntary sector organization, you're not just relying on funding from, from the government. Um, you're not just relying on funding that's just going to be like you're doing in terms of whether you have a, a charity shop or anything else. You're also going to be relying on funding from private sources as well in order to deliver many of the services you want to deliver. So you need to have that constant relationship between all three again to in order to deliver the service. What's the outcome we want? We've got to be outcomes driven in all of this. Uh, Anna Sauer, thanks. And thanks to all for that, that discussion. I'm going to move on to, to question two. Forgive me for going a bit rapidly. It's just to get, get through the, the, the agenda. Great question. Number two, it comes from among many, many others, the William Grant Foundation and the Ganachy Trust. The question is, how can the Scottish Parliament provide greater funding, stability and security to the sector and how will you, I guess, the politicians, ensure the sector is strong enough to continue making a difference? I'm going to go straight to the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, on this one, please. Funding stability. So the question, interestingly, is stability, and I want to come on to that centrally, but of course, you know, quantum of funding matters as well. So that is the first uh, responsibility of, of government and parliament, you know, the, not just the last year, the last decade has been really tough with austerity and you know pressure on uh, public funding. 
Throughout that, the Scottish Government has uh, sought to protect the, the government funding we allocate to the third sector throughout the pandemic. We've allocated uh, money through the uh, COVID uh, third sector resilience fund. We've now established a, a recovery fund. Uh, so we've got a responsibility to make sure that we are as far as we can within budgets, giving the voluntary sector the, the priority it merits and perhaps greater priority following on from what we said earlier on than it has had. Uh, the second point, though, is much more about stability. And, yes. you know, every yes. year that's when the, I... That's uh, the emphasis of much, much of the question. I yeah. address the SCVO uh, annual event, this question comes up. Um, and what we want to do, and our manifesto uh, will talk about this, we've talked about it in the past, is move to multi-year funding deals. Now, there is a, a restriction uh, on the ability of the Scottish Government to some extent to do that because such a big chunk of our funding comes from uh, Westminster through the Barnett formula. That's not always given on a three-year basis, but within that we want to find the way of, of moving to that multi-year funding arrangement to give the sector and organisations within the sector more ability to look ahead and to plan ahead with, with greater certainty. And then I think there is support and the recovery fund uh, has a strand that, that tries to recognize this already it's about supporting the sector itself to become more sustainable to think yeah. itself about the strategic imperatives and you know whether in some areas working together might allow them to deliver greater outcomes and supporting them with you know fundraising uh, sustainability but also this links directly back to the the part of the, the first question in supporting the, the sector to grow what it does and grow the contribution it makes, uh, then it is creating greater revenue streams uh, for itself. So it's a mix. Isn't, 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 isn't there a danger that if the very smallest organisations come together in, in the, the interests of financial efficiency, they perhaps lose the, the local connections and they, they lose almost the voluntary nature? So I, I think that is one of the big dilemmas and, and one of the big challenges and I actually don't think it is right for somebody like me to dictate Good and response. certainly not yeah. to put pressure on the, the point Willie Rennie made at the start of the uh, at the end sorry of the, the last question there is one I recognise and government grapples with all the time the balance and procurement between the, the need to drive efficiency for taxpayers money versus which I think should actually have most of the focus the value in, in what you're procuring um, and that same tension is there for the sector itself and it's often I know for the sector one of the biggest controversies uh, in terms of the debates that okay. the sector has I, I know from my own constituency experience how vital locally based locally rooted organizations are and and I don't think we should risk losing that but you know these are questions that everybody has to grapple with from time to time. Thanks for that. Well, everybody's got a grapple here tonight. Douglas Ross from the Conservatives. First of all, it's good to hear the question came from the William Grant Foundation. They've got strong links in my home area. Of uh, course, uh, yes. Glenfiddich Distillery in Dufton uh, being the source of, of a lot of uh, the work they do uh, and outstanding work they do across the country. Uh, so I think, again, we're probably all going to agree with this. Uh, yes, obviously, uh, voluntary organisations want as much financial support as possible, but I think even more important than that is financial stability. And you don't get that with one-year funding settlements. So we want to... and. You know, we're setting out plans to extend uh, this uh, funding to a multi-year settlement. So the organisation... But you, but you heard the First Minister saying that one of the constraints is that the Scottish Government has to operate within a, a funding settlement, which itself is sometimes not multi-year, it's sometimes annual. So I absolutely agree at a UK level... And that's down to the UK Government. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying, Brian. I absolutely agree at a UK level. I'd like to see that moving to multi-years as well. As we've had in the past, we've had funding settlements up to three years before in the past. I think people have understood when there have been um, fiscal interventions over the last year, you know, we've not waited uh, and, and set out longer term pro uh, programmes while we've had to introduce emergency measures. But by introducing multi-year uh, financial settlements, it gives more stability, it allows planning ahead, and it allows the focus and the resources to be on delivering services, not looking and being concerned about where the support and funding is coming from next. So I think that's crucial. The other point I would make is it's not just about the direct support that goes to voluntary organisations. Many of the attendees on the call uh, this evening, I would assume, also get their support from local councils. Uh, and I served as a councillor for 10 years. Yeah. And again, the uncertainty if you didn't get a three-year funding settlement about how you could plan your resources going forward meant sometimes you had to take very difficult decisions to cut what you knew were, were extremely reliable and well-used services 
services because the funding wasn't secured going forward. So again, it's not just our voluntary organisations. Uh, a new framework for local council funding will also provide certainty for charities who get their income uh, and uh, voluntary organisations who get their income that, from um, local councils. Thanks for that. Two billion of income from the public sector for the voluntary sector in Scotland. Of that, sixty percent generated through contract service provision so it, it really is it's it's a big business as well albeit a, a business that's diverse and as Sawar from Labour please. Thanks Brian I think it's a fair criticism to talk about the the consistency of, of, of budgets from UK Parliament to the Scottish Parliament but I think the same criticism obviously applies from Scottish Parliament to local government and um, you have seen real challenges around local government budgets and the impact that then has on community organisations um, across the, the country. Uh, Nicholas Surgeon rightly references what was the perfect storm. I mean, you, uh, when we had following the banking crisis, 10 years of austerity, it was the perfect storm for the voluntary sector where you had austerity and a cuts of budgets, uh, particularly at local government level. Um, you had lots more uh, businesses struggling as a result. You had a lot less fundraising, therefore more difficult challenges coming through uh, private sector means in order to try and make up for some of the shortfall that may have come from reduced funding from, from local government means uh, or central government means. Uh, and I think that we risk that same perfect storm again coming through this pandemic. Uh, and you've already seen stats from the SCB on social, uh, social Enterprise Scotland showing that 50% of uh, charities across Scotland worry about their money running out, 20% of charities saying they're at a critical stage and they might fall within 12 months. That, that's going to be really stark for us. Um, so if we are going to have sustainability, we've got to make sure we don't choke off um, our support mechanism as we come through this pandemic. We can't go straight to a cuts agenda like we've done uh, after the banking crisis. We've got to invest to grow uh, in our economy and get ourselves sustainable again in the future. So that's one part of it in terms of budgets for, from the Scottish yeah. government, but also local government budgets. Uh, we've also got to make sure we do much longer term uh, funding packages. It was a reference made, I think Patrick made the reference right at the start about how lots of charities have to split up their time. Uh, you know, they spend half their time having to worry about where the next application is going to come from yeah. and they're only half the time then actually delivering the services they want to deliver. That's not sustainable. Nice. Alice, thanks, Alice, thanks for that. I, I'm, this is much more important. For, forgive me for interrupting. I'm going to bring in Nicola Sturgeon later on the, the question about local authority funding, which is, of course, in the hands of our government. But and before that, Willie Rennie and then Patrick Harvey, please, on, on this question of funding and funding stability. Willie Rennie. Multi-year funding is something we've aspired to for years, but we've not actually delivered it for many years. And you can understand why organisations are not as effective if they're having to spend so much of their time worrying about whether they have got the money for the next month or the next year. We need organisations to have that stability so they can plan for the longer term and be much more effective for the people that they're serving. So we need to sort this. And we know why it's happened, that one of the most unstable political periods for some time, which is why I'm arguing in this election campaign, we actually need a period of stability so we can focus on recovery. That's part of it. But we do need to move towards multi-year um, settlements and that requires a bit of certainty for the Scottish Government as well as councils to make sure that they can make those decisions for the longer term and we can't just go through the cycle of having periods of multi-year settlements and then go back to the way it was before that because that is equally damaging. We lose really good quality people because they worry about whether they've got a job next month. That needs to change so we can keep good people have effective organisations so we can serve people much more effectively. Thanks for that. Patrick Harvey, please, from the Greens. Um, one really interesting question that, that hasn't come up so far is around voluntary giving. We've, we've heard a lot from behavioural experts during COVID about people's public health behaviour. Uh, I'd like to see the same kind of experts uh, have a, a, a really deep look into people's spending, saving and giving behaviour during this pandemic. There have been a lot of people who've suffered financially during the pandemic. There's been a lot of other people who've had secure incomes, they've been spending less money, and it seems that they've been saving more and giving less. So I'd like to uh, explore that a little bit as well. The, there, are some, there are some questions that, that have come up that I agree with totally, expanding the role of the, uh, the voluntary sector into other areas that are currently uh, private sector and, and profit-driven. 
uh, would help to, to bring in new sources of revenue. But you can't do that by fiat. You can't do that by fiat or dictat, can you, Patrick? You, you, it's the very nature no. of the voluntary sector is it has to be something that arises. You can't simply say, "I no, identify you, that." Volunteers, please no, fix. You, can, you can't do that. No, but you can open the door and you can create the opportunities. And at the moment, those doors are closed off. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the the last thing is is around this uh, issue of, of multi year funding and. Absolutely, there is this chain of responsibility from UK to Scottish uh, to local government uh, and also to, to the, the voluntary and third sector. Uh, and we, we need to challenge the not just the, the one year funding uh, of the UK government, but for the last couple of years, we've had this bizarre cart before horse position where local councils have to set their budgets. Then the Scottish government sets its budget. And then we finally find out how much is in the overall financial envelope from the UK. So we need the voluntary sector, the Scottish government, the, the Welsh and Northern Irish uh, administrations all to be challenging the UK on this. And I think there's a lot of the voluntary sector in England as well who are equally, nobody knows what's going on with the, these budgets. The, the last thing I want to say is about local government though, uh, yeah. because yes, giving multi-year funding to local government and protecting local government funding uh, is important. But if it again is just a grant, a block grant being given by central government in Edinburgh to the local councils, that's not going to be enough. We should be pushing fiscal power down the chain so that local councils can decide for themselves what their tax base is, where they're going to raise revenue from, so that they have the ability to raise what's necessary in the right way, given local circumstances. And that means they're not dependent on waiting for the Scottish government say so before they can start giving uh, a proper settlement uh, to the local uh, voluntary organisations. And it's often the smallest, most vulnerable ones that have the closest relationship with local instead of central government. Many thanks for that. I'm going to bring in Nicola Sturgeon on that and also a claim that's been made by the Conservatives that under your party's control of, of, of Holyrood, roughly £1 billion has been in effect withheld from local government because of the funding mechanism you've deployed. What about that and what about the, the point about uh, local government requiring its own funding controls? Well, I, I maybe come uh, to the, the claim. I, I don't know the basis of the claim and I would be very sceptical about it, but you know, I'll come to that in the course of my answer. Yeah. To pick up on the last point there about yes. further devolution of, of power and, and tax raising, um, you know, we've had the local governance review before the pandemic, of course, we had already decided that things like a, a tourism tax should be something that local authorities had the ability to levy. Some of that was put in hold as we went through the pandemic. But I do think there's a rich seam of, of discussion there for us in the, the new parliament. Look, the funding situation, and there are questions, legitimate questions for the Scottish government here that I'm not trying to, to shrug off, but we, we have a chain of funding. Um, Largely, obviously, the Scottish Government now has limited tax varying powers, but largely Westminster decides the, the overall quantum and the uh, whether it's a one year or a three year uh, arrangement. That then is passed on to the Scottish Government, that then largely determines what the Scottish Government can do in terms of the funding settlement for local government, and that then determines what local government can do in terms of the, the funding decisions it makes. So you know, no bit of that chain is completely independent from the whole. So if we have meaning, have to have meaningful reform of that, it really does, at the moment, have to start with how Westminster does its budgeting. Within that, though, we have decisions to make, whatever the, the, the total budget we have over the period of austerity. It's been a torrid time for local government. There's no two ways about that. Local government has, you know, had it tough. But if you look at the budgetary decisions we have taken and it was consensus all along I think that we had to protect the National Health Service which is a, a significant portion of the overall Scottish budget and then after that we tried to protect local government as far as we could and you know where I'll come back to the Tory claim and bear in mind I don't really know the basis of that one billion pounds okay. figure you look at the situation the funding position for Scottish local authorities compared to the massacre of funding uh, for local authorities in England, then I'm not sure many people would choose to stop being in, in Scotland for England. English local authorities have suffered much, much greater cuts because there hasn't been that same uh, willingness to try to protect as far as, as possible. Um, but there's, there's no doubt that we all have to reflect on an ongoing basis about how we divvy up the budgets we've got. And that does then tell you the things and, and derives from the priorities you set. Do, do you accept, I mean, just, I'll move on to Douglas Ross in a second, but very, very briefly, do you accept that if there is a, a pattern, a, a, a programme of UK 
austerity, which was the, the intent of previous chancellors, mm. if, if within that there is constraint for the Scottish government and constraint for local government following that, there must have been severe constraints placed upon the voluntary sector in Scotland as well. Absolutely. And, and don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to say that none of that should fall on my shoulders because yeah. we make our decisions. What I'm trying to say, though, and I think most people get this, is the context in which we make those decisions, the totality of the budget is driven by those austerity decisions. So if if the Scottish government's uh, budget is being reduced through the austerity cuts of the last decade, then we have less money to pass on to local government, which then in turn has less money to pass on to the voluntary sector. That's the point about the, the funding chain that I'm making. Of course, the more, and this argument can be made in terms of the relationship between Scottish government and local government, absolutely legitimately, but the more the Scottish government has powers uh, over taxes, what taxes we le levy, you know, what decisions we make there, the more of these powers that lie in the hands of the Scottish government, then the less ability somebody like me has to say, well, we're constrained by Westminster, which is an important part of taking responsibility for the decisions we, we make. Thank you very much indeed for that. Douglas Ross, then Willie Rennie, please. Douglas, what is the basis of your claim that, that uh, local government is, is, is a billion pounds so short? So the basis of that claim is in 2007-8, when the SNP came to power, the percentage of funding, Scottish government funding, going to local authorities was 35.9%. In 2019-20, the percentage of the budget was down to 33%, and therefore there has been a billion pounds over the course of that uh, time that the SNP have been in power that had the percentage stayed the same, local authorities across Scotland would have had a billion pounds extra to spend. Now, I know Nicola Sturgeon always wants to point south of the border and say, well, if it's bad here, it's worse, worse in England. Well, it is, it is a reasonable point that under, under the well, first no, not, not in an election, Brian, when we are electing MSPs to Holyrood, to the Scottish Parliament, to deal with the issues in Scotland. And I think what people are looking for uh, in this campaign, in this election, and from this Parliament that we're about to elect on the 6th of May, is actually dealing with the issues in Scotland. There is, uh, you know, issues in other parts of the United Kingdom that will be dealt with at other times, but we are focused as Scottish Conservatives on what's happening here in Scotland. I'll bring in the other three in a moment. Very briefly, Nicola Sturgeon, since, since you're... So, two, two, two points. You, you can't have a grown-up debate, Douglas, that just the ignores where power and responsibility lies. I've not, and I think people will have heard me say, I'm not trying to shrug off the responsibilities that lie with me, but you know, we can't have a real proper debate unless we're prepared to engage in some of the complexities of this properly. The second point, and I don't know, I'm happy to look at this later on if uh, if I need to, but you know, in the past when the Tories have done that calculation, they take, they've failed to take account of some reclassification of spending over the years. So for example, I think police funding used to lie within local uh, authority budgets and, and doesn't anymore. Uh, so, you know, I'm not entirely convinced that you are comparing like with like on that, certainly on past experience of looking at some of these exercises. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks for that. Uh, uh, wait, wait, let's go to Patrick Harvey. Patrick, your hand was raised. Patrick, then Anna, then Willie Rennie, please. Just very briefly, the, the other thing, it's not just about whether it's comparing like with like and whether budgets have shifted around. Throughout all of the time Douglas is talking about, uh, his party was demanding that every penny of health consequentials go to health. Now, that, that might well have been a reasonable thing to ask for. Uh, and we all supported spending on, on the NHS. But if that's going up as part of the, the overall budget because of those health consequentials, you can't then complain that the percentage of everything else has gone down. We do need a fiscal framework between central government and local government. And I think there's, there's a case for a, a better fiscal framework in relation to the, uh, the voluntary sector as well. But it's, it's got to be more sophisticated than just sticking with a single percentage. Because in relation to something like the pandemic, when you come through a period like this, you have to spend money on a large scale on certain things. And, and you can't just have it, you know, ring fence percentages because that just, it just won't work if we need to invest in something like the health service. Patrick, Patrick thanks for that. On this financial question, Willie Rennie, Anna Sawar, and then a final word on the financial question to Douglas Ross. Willie Rennie first, please. I mean, there is no doubt that the, the health service in the UK and in Scotland is actually consuming an awful lot more of our general budget. And that's obviously going to have an impact on percentages. So I think Nicola is right in terms of the crude uh, calculations. But what's also true is the way that local government has been treated has been unfair. Because although, yes, on occasions the budget does go up, the requirements on local government, the stipulations, the entitlements that government require of local government have gone up as well. So effectively they're having to cut other parts of their responsibilities. 
And that's having a direct impact. It's meaning that people are having to lose their jobs, services are going in local government. So yes, Nicola, we should have a mature debate about these things, but we need to have a much more responsible debate about how we're treating local government. And it hasn't been fair in recent years because we play this silly game of increasing the entitlements, increasing the funding, saying they're getting more funding, when in reality they're facing cuts on their core activity. But the final thing is, I think, yep. the value of social enterprises, I think, has been underestimated. Because I want organisations that aren't beholden to just one single source of income, whether it's government, local government, in, or the private sector or donations. We need a variety of different income sources so we can bring stability to the sector so they are not subject to the cycles, the political cycles, that often means that they go from boom to bust very quickly. That yeah. needs to change. Thanks for that, Willie. Anna Sarwar and then Douglas Ross. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, look, t take out the past year, because obviously the, the, the COVID response and the exponential yeah. increases in budget have, have obviously made things uh, very, very different. I hope we can continue that higher level of support uh, into the recovery phase. Um, Nicholas Sturgeon is right around the, the period of austerity. Um, and we saw, you know, a 3% reduction in, in the Scottish government budget. But, but the problem is, whilst the Scottish government was, uh, budget was reduced by 3%, we were cutting local government budgets by 12%. We were actually taking a, a cut from Westminster and multiplying it and putting it down to local government. Um, so, so I think we just got to be a bit more honest and transparent about the, the double effect uh, that happened in the local government rather than just what's happening at a local level. But to take it back to the original question here, which was about yes. sustainability of... Um, the voluntary sector, the way we're going to get sustainability of the voluntary sector is, again, going back to the partnership. It's about having a much more open dialogue, which recognises that short-term solutions aren't going to work. It's going to require longer-term commitments, so not one-year funding models, three-year funding models. It's going to mean treating voluntary sector as partners, because quite often what happens is voluntary sector get a fall off a cliff edge in terms of losing funding and they don't get that transitional support they need in order to plan for that ahead so i, I think a much more partnership-like approach between local government and the voluntary sector central government and the voluntary sector is really really important if we are going to have that sustainability okay i'm going to bring in douglas ross for the final word but nicola sturgeon i feel you're entitled to a, a bit of a, a, an answer to the points they made made rare by willie rennie and anna Salwa. um I, I i don't want to in any way be defensive here i i, I will take issue with some of the the, the the figures that are being bandied about because often when we look at those figures whether it's the one billion pounds or the three percent twelve percent that Annis has just used you find they're not quite what they seem but but let's not get diverted into that there is a there's a serious issue here which we all have to address maturely about you know when you have uh, budgets under pressure and for the Scottish government with the, the limited borrowing powers and the limited tax varying powers we have budgets that are to all intents and purposes finite, then how do you divvy up these budgets? Now, for those who say we should have given more to local government, which I would love, always love to do over the past few years, you also then have to say, well, what budgets should we have allocated less to? Uh, the health service takes up rightly and properly such a significant part of the overall Scottish budget that when you protect that, you do inevitably make the decisions elsewhere more difficult, but you cannot, you can't just have one side of this debate. You have to have the whole debate when you're in effectively a finite budget situation. If you want to give more to one budget line, you have to decide where you're taking from. The green income tax proposal that generated all the extra money then. So we, we yeah, used our very income briefly, tax very powers. Briefly. We used our income tax powers and we, in uh, one budget, negotiated with the Greens on that, I think more than one budget. So, but you can't, when you've got one significant tax lever, in our case, income tax, you know, common sense tells you, you can't just keep putting income tax up and up and up. So we've used that uh, and we've used it well and productively. That's shielding the health service, it's shielding local government from what would otherwise have been uh, cuts that we had to make. But we have very limited ability to vary taxes across the piece. So the budget is to a large extent finite, which is why if you want to say more should go here, you have to engage in the discussion about where it comes from. Right. Level. Right. Even right. since 1999, you've had the ability to change local taxes with far more flexibility than has ever been used. Thanks for that, Patrick. Anna, 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 a word from Anna and then a final word from Douglas Ross. You can also say we've increased local government budgets, but we've had to make difficult choices and we've had to take money. You either, you either cut or you, you raised. You, I don't think you can claim to. Have I, I didn't say that. I, I didn't and, deny that local government has, in the era of austerity, it has had real difficulties with budgets. So I, I didn't say that. What I challenged was 
that we, in making those difficult decisions, treated local government really unfairly. That is not the same as saying local government have had it easy. We did treat them uh, Douglas Ross, please. So if I can finish on a point that hopefully everyone agrees with, but I understand they won't, uh, one figure you can't question is that the Scottish Government budget is now higher than at any point since devolution. So there is more money for the Scottish Government from the UK Government. It is at, at its highest level since devolution. And the final point that I put to Nicola Sturgeon in terms of her argument about having two sides to, to the same issue, there are also two sides to the issue that the Scottish Government cannot continue to ask local councils to do more and more with less. And that's why councils are struggling at the moment because they are being asked to provide greater and greater services by the Scottish Government, but they're not given the support to do so. And that, therefore, has a knock-on effect to budgets and difficult decisions that are taken that has an impact on our voluntary organisations. Douglas Ross, thanks. I, I, I had intended that to be the final word, but it turned out to be a terminological inexactitude. I'm going to bring in Willie Rennie and then Nicola Sturgeon. Willie uh, first, please. It, it, is a, it is a silly point, Douglas. Of course the Scottish Government budget is higher than it's ever been. We've just been through a pandemic where the government is actually employing a large proportion of the population. It's a silly point to make. But what we need to do, Nicola argues for the Scottish Parliament to have greater responsibility so it can make its own decisions. I think the same should apply to local government. We need to allow them to raise the majority of the money that they spend, because if you do that, you can control your own destiny and you can work with local third sector organisations so that they can control their own destiny as well. That's the best way of doing it. If it applies to the Scottish Parliament, it should equally apply to local government too. In a word, in a word, Nicola Sturgeon, final word. So I, I actually agree with that. And I, and I think that is one of our big challenges and opportunities in the next parliament. Actually, the main point I was going to make, or two very brief points, Willie's already made it. That is a facile point, Douglas. And if that's the best you can do, then that's a pretty poor show. We're in a pandemic. Of course, the budget is the highest it's ever been. But the final point is, yes, local government will often say that national government is asking them to do things that are not properly funded, and sometimes they may have a point, uh, but we actually do work with local government to we come to agreements about how we fund things we're asking them to do. If you take the biggest expansion we're asking local government to deliver right now, which is in childcare, we came to an agreement with COSLA about the revenue and the capital funding, additional funding for that. So uh, on some occasions that might be fair, but it's not always the case. Let, so, let's, be, let's be extra fair and give Douglas Ross a final word. That, thank that, you, Brian. Excellently refereed there, I have to say. First of all, I'm sure, again, all the party leaders would accept that the budget has been increasing prior to COVID pandemic. Of course, the £13.3 billion pounds additional support over yeah, the last... You're getting a lot of head shaking there, that. Douglas. A if, lot of head Nicola shaking. Surgeon is saying the previous budget before that did not see an increase from Westminster, then I think she oh, has to go back and check that. Yeah, 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 as well. no. And just, 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 just on Willie Rennie's point, he was saying... Of course, it would be high because the government have been funding jobs for the last year. That was the UK government funding those jobs, Willie Rennie. That was not part of the Barnet consequential. So you need to brush up in your figures as well. Folk, folks, I'm going to call you. Call you. Oh, I, I'm, I'm seeing head shaking and puffing. We should go back to talking about the voluntary sector. No, also, I think we, we will go back to talking indeed about the voluntary sector, although we, we, we did throw out there and, and the voluntary sector operates in the climate of financial d d discussions and I'm sure that was good. Let's, let's move on to question three. Uh, ran a bit over on the finance, but I, you know, I'll, uh, I, was, I was due to give some closing thoughts. I'll dump them. Question three comes from, among others, Community Resources Network Scotland and Community Transport Association. The question is this. This year, the eyes of the world will be on Scotland as Glasgow plays host to COP26. How will Scotland's political parties work with the voluntary sector in order that we can all, and I quote, think globally, but act locally, close quotes, as we seek to tackle the climate emergency. Let's go to Patrick Harvey first on this one, please, Patrick. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that the COP is coming to Glasgow is obviously an extremely engaging and exciting event. Uh, I wish to goodness that Scotland had its seat at the negotiating table. Of course, I, I, I wish that. But even, even without that, and even with uh, you know ourselves being represented by a a government which uh, seems willing to let the the fossil fuel lobbyists in uh, and uh, you know unethical uh, you know palm oil producers and so on continue to be sponsors of the COP, even despite that, the fact that it's happening is a, an opportunity to change the domestic conversation on climate, uh, perhaps like nothing ever before. And on many of the issues that I've already talk, talked about, our food system, our public transport our energy system, uh, a whole host of aspects of our economy, which are 
inter intimately linked to our, our climate emissions. Uh, running a lot more of these in uh, in a not for -pro profit basis, uh, including with the, the voluntary sector and a, a decentralized ownership uh, at community level is one of the most important things that we can do, uh, not just to take responsibility, to, but, but to give communities the power and the ability to make these changes that are necessary and to make them in a way that makes our, our society more equal as well. There is an incredible opportunity if we will only stop firing uh, you know, tax breaks and subsidies of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, every political party on this panel is using language in this election like net zero and just transition. And yet every other party than the Greens is still wanting to support more exploration for oil and gas, despite knowing that we've got three times more of the stuff than we can ever afford to use. We need to be winding that down not talking about a just transition by 2040 or 2050, but right now, and we need to be investing in the sustainable jobs of the future. And I think a, a great many of those jobs can be uh, created in, a, in, in not for profit organizations, whether that's the, the traditional voluntary sector, uh, social enterprise, uh, or decentralized community ownership. There's an incredible opportunity for change. And if we don't grasp it, uh, we will have failed not just uh, this and the next generation, but everyone that comes after. But thank you very much indeed. You had two points there. The point about the North Sea, if you will forgive me, I'll try and steer clear of that when it's a discussion for a huge discussion, a discussion perhaps for another time. But your main point about the involvement of the voluntary sector is the basis of this question. And I'm going to bring in Willie Rennie on, on that. The working with the voluntary sector to think globally but act lo locally, Willie. Uh, I, th I think the this moment needs to be a moment of unity. Um, we've just had a change in the President of the United States with a successor who is much more amenable to working together across the globe. And we need to use that opportunity to make that happen. But how can we use the voluntary sector, the third sector? I think part of this is to use your mass membership to take people with us, because some of this will require uncomfortable behavioral change. So we need organizations like the RSPB, one of the biggest charities in the country to play their part. And I know they already do other work in terms of the innovation that's taken place in bodies like Reflex in Orkney, that's a unique you know, multi-sector agency that's bringing together and bringing in new technologies to make a change in people's lives on an individual basis. Another great initiative. We need to make sure they've got a place. On education, the Teach First group of young people who are trying to get the climate at the heart of their curriculum, again, taking people with us to make sure we can secure that change. The 2050 project on leadership for young people. And then little projects like um, the plant project in my constituency in Tayport, which is a community garden, but it's doing education as well as mental health, social cohesion, all of those projects together, but taking people with us to make that happen. And then furniture projects, reusing projects, upcycling, all that stuff. All these people have got great ideas and we need to give them a platform to spread that best practice, not just within Scotland and their communities, but right across the world as well. That's the opportunity that we've got. If we can use this platform effectively, real practical action, the practical steps, world leading steps that we are taking in this country to make a change. That's the real potential of the voluntary sector being part of COP26. And I'm, Really quite excited about that because I think the potential is great. Well, thanks very much indeed. How nice to hear a mention of Tayport there. They are a very lucky, blessed community indeed, and in that they can gaze across the River Tay to the cradle of civilization on the other side. But let's bring in Douglas Ross here. D Douglas, on, on, on working with the voluntary sector to think globally but act locally. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I would agree with a lot of what Willie Rennie has said. First of all, I think it's great that the UK has secured this conference. And yes, Glasgow will showcase itself, as it always does in these major events. But it's about the whole of Scotland. It's about what we can showcase from north, south, east and west. And I think that's what I would take from this question is that there's already so much great work happening with our voluntary organisations in the third sector in many of these areas. We, you know, we discussed earlier about the diverse range of issues that the voluntary sector works in here in Scotland, including uh, uh, dealing with climate change and, and um, uh, elements within that. Uh, and a lot of the projects Willie mentioned, I've got a number uh, in, in Murray in the north of Scotland that I know really want to be involved. So what I think is crucial is over the next few weeks and months, we make it as easy as possible uh, for 
businesses, groups, organisations in Scotland to showcase to that international audience what is already being done here in Scotland and the potential we have going forward. Because the one thing I don't want to see is COP26 ending up being 11 days when we have world leaders coming to Glasgow, a discussion, but no long-term legacy. COP26 will only be a success if we change attitudes, change behaviours, and that starts from a local level to show what we can, could and should do and take that onto an international stage. And the volunteer organisation organisations on this call will play a crucial role in that. Douglas, thanks. Anas Sarwar, then Nicola Sturgeon. Anas, please. Thank you, Brian. COP26 is a massive moment for us here in Scotland, a massive moment for Glasgow, but indeed across the whole of Scotland when the eyes of the world are going to be on Glasgow. And we've got to make sure we take huge, um, we take up that opportunity. It's a huge economic opportunity, if nothing else, for us uh, in terms of the challenges the country has faced over the last year. And to come through that is a huge opportunity for us to show that Scotland is open again, which is also a, a great chance for us. But I also want us to come through COP26 and have what people will remember as being the Glasgow Agreement. That opportunity, as Willie has said, with a new president in the US, with a new focus on the climate emergency, where the world starts taking seriously the plans that we need to make in order to, and that start delivering them in terms of confronting the climate emergency so we leave a better planet for our children and our grandchildren. And where the voluntary sector can play the role is one, the voluntary sector has already been playing its role in terms of pushing the parliament around its own ambitions, around setting targets, around uh, emissions. Um, it's got a huge role to play in terms of uh, education and how we get people engaged in what's happening around COP, particularly our young people. I know from my own kids how engaged they are with COP26, how engaged they are with environmentalism, but also all those things that we need to do here in Scotland, recognising that climate change doesn't recognise borders, but we can lead by example here in Scotland about things we need to do around our uh, public services, things around our public transport, around the way that we do do business, around the way we create employability, around the way we complete, create green jobs for the future. That all has to be a broad partnership uh, with the voluntary sector so we can deliver it and have a, a massive legacy coming from COP26. Thank you very much indeed for that. Nic Nicola Sturgeon, on, on that, that the, the working with the voluntary sector, but also perhaps a word about what the next Scottish Parliament can do more broadly on tackling the, the climate emergency, perhaps picking up on, on some of the points, the other points that Patrick Harvey made. Nicola Sturgeon, please. Um, I'll come back to that in a yeah. second. Actually, I, I think this question helpfully gets us back to focusing more uh, yeah. directly on the role of the voluntary sector. I think in the last question, us leaders probably focus a bit too much on you know, what we spend on local government. Often what we can learn most from the voluntary sector is not what we should do, but how we best do it on funding, not just what we spend, but how we spend it most effectively, early intervention, for example. And that's the lesson here. You know, I think the voluntary sector has got a huge part to play as we lead up to COP, massive, massive opportunity, and then come out of COP. Effectively, what I think the role is, and if, if I'm re-elected as First Minister, I give an absolute guarantee uh, this evening that the Scottish Government will work very closely with the voluntary sector in the run-up to COP. But I think, firstly, the sector can use the power of its campaigning might. Um, one of the objectives for COP, and one we want to play our part in, is ensuring that there is a Glasgow agreement that comes out of it that really accelerates the, the global yeah. path to net zero. Uh, there's a real opportunity for the voluntary sector to help through a campaigning lobbying sense to really put the pressure on world leaders to do that domestically and put the pressure on the Scottish government to make sure our plans live up to our rhetoric and then use the diversity of the sector and, and what the the hundreds, thousands of organisations do with their own members and, and service users to drive that attitudinal and behaviour change that we know we need to see. That in itself won't deliver net zero. That takes yeah. government, industry to, to more than play their part, but we need to galvanise that as well. And I think the, the voluntary sector, particularly perhaps amongst young people, have got a massive part to play. Um, in terms of just very briefly, yeah, very briefly you know, ta tackling the climate change in the next session of Parliament, uh, together with and actually integrally connected to the challenge of COVID recovery is the biggest uh, priority and responsibility all of us have. And you know we've got the targets in place, we've got the plan in place. It is about making sure that we live up to that often. And I will exempt Patrick from this for the main part, but often when we come to do the really difficult things that we have to do here, that's when the political consensus breaks down. And we've got to be prepared not just to talk the talk on tackling climate change, but walk the walk as well. And that's a challenge for government. But it's a challenge for opposition as well, because not all of these things will be popular at the point that you have to do them. 
because I know, let's put that challenge to the opposition. Let's put it. Uh, the, 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 the question is, within the, the, the discussion about the voluntary sector, what can the next parliament of, of, of the Scottish Parliament do on the question of climate change? Let's talk first to the exempted one, Patrick Harvey. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that point about politically challenging decisions, yes, there, there are going to be politically challenging decisions. And, you know, to take one tiny example, one tiny example of a sustainable transport policy uh, that also empowered local government, uh, the workplace parking levy, which is not even imposing it from the centre, but just allowing councils to consider whether to, to implement something like that. As soon as we started talking about it, uh, most of the other opposition parties threw their hands up in horror uh, and started talking about the rights of drivers. So, you know, we, we need to be offering people uh, an alternative to, to the current unsustainable ways of living rather than just more of the same. But the, you know, the point about these targets, we've, we've set these targets. And I'm, you know, I've been involved in this debate since uh, I, I chaired the Climate Change Committee when we debated the first act. And I'm, I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of debating what the targets should be and then missing the targets. We've been repeatedly missing the targets that have been set in Scotland. And that's a result of things like transport policy, where transport emissions are going up, not down. But I'm also thinking about that role for the voluntary sector. And the first budget concession we ever got from the SNP in 2007-8 was the Climate Challenge Fund. A few million quid a year. Uh, it's grown a little bit, but it's, it's not huge. It doesn't go far across the whole of Scotland, but it's about empowering communities to put their own solutions uh, into practice. I recognise, Brian, you don't want to talk about oil and gas policy, but just think about this. I have a word. By, by all means, go for it, but just keep it brief. I'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not complaining, but just think about the scale of that oil and gas subsidy and tax breaks that are going to the industry that has brought us to the brink of ecological meltdown. If we were putting that scale of investment into the community organisations that are cutting people's energy waste, uh, you know, growing food locally, running local transport, and yes, generating energy renewable, renewably in local community hands, we could make a transformational change across our society. And we wouldn't then be debating, you know, are we going to miss this year's target again? Patrick, thank you very much indeed. Willie Rennie, then Anna Sawa, then Douglas Ross on this. What, what can the next parliament do on climate change? Willie Rennie. Right, I'm going to resist. Um, Nicola now says the climate is the most important issue. I think we might hear something else during this election campaign as being the top priority. But I'm going to resist uh, talking about that. These things are not all separate, Willie. They're actually pretty <laughs> all linked. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, Nicola, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> the, the, the challenge for us is to change the way that industry works, society works, transport works, home energy works, and there's lots of new technologies that we need to exploit and progress quickly. So things like the use of hydrogen for transport, making sure that we can increase the cycling and walking investment, making sure that we don't in support a third runway at Heathrow, which I think the Scottish government should come out and oppose now very clearly, but it refuses to do so. These are hard decisions because they make hard choices. But on issues like making sure that we can exploit fully the renewables potential of our coast, the fact that we're still building the jackets for the wind turbines on the other side of the planet and hauling them back over here is just an, please. Yeah. we need to build up an industrial capacity to make sure we can exploit that potential so we can get that just transition that's the way we do it and take people with us Thank that you. to me is the answer for this thanks for that again briefly please anas sawar and douglas ross anas first so question the, the, the question brian was specifically around what we can do with the, with the next the, parliament yeah with, with, with the voluntary sector in the next parliament um, I, I think there's a whole host of things about how we protect our natural environment there's a whole host of work that's already been done by many voluntary sector organizations about making communities more aware about how they themselves um, can have carbon reduction plans what personal actions they can take i think there's huge opportunities around our public transport system, making it much more community owned uh, companies are, are, and then the public transport system in public hands, free public transport uh, in may, as many places as we can as well. So we get people out of cars and into, into the public transport system, pushing down our emissions, thinking about the new jobs of the future and how many more of them can be pushed towards uh, that way in terms of our climate responsibilities, using the, the public sector as a force for good in terms of any contracts that we have, whether that be contracts we have with, with businesses or indeed contracts we have with third sector organizations, making sure they have a climate reduction plan that's conditional upon Briefly, getting that funding. Briefly, please. These are all big, bold things we can do in the next parliament if we have the will. I would also say there are some things that go beyond party politics. 
we, we shouldn't always think, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the TV debate here for a moment, I'm sorry. Um, you know, when it comes to climate change, we should all be able to work together when we agree. Okay, we can argue when we disagree, but see, when we agree, we should kind of try and make it work. <laughs> and that's, that, that, Douglas Ross on, on, on this, uh, Douglas Ross on this question of the environment. Yeah, no, and exactly what, what we would do in this next parliament. Well, on Monday, uh, while all the other leaders, with the understandable exception of Patrick and, and myself, were getting their hair cut, I was, because the barbers and the hairdressers were open, I was launching our nature bill and what we would introduce in the Scottish Parliament in terms of nature. So we'd increase the tree planting in the country, we'd look to protect the 9% of species in Scotland that are under threat uh, from extinction because of uh, climate change and many other issues. Uh, and also tomorrow, so to kind of bookend this week, that's what I announced on Monday, uh, tomorrow and Friday, uh, I'm announcing our plans. For, for a green recovery. So again, to, to go back to Anna Sarver's point, I think the parties can agree on this. There are areas where uh, we may see a different route to get to the final destination, but we all understand uh, the priority here, the fact that we need to tackle this in the next parliament, and it is something that we have to focus on, both as part of our recovery from COVID-19, but as our uh, role uh, as parliamentarians and, and politicians looking to secure a far better future for our children and our grandchildren uh, and a far better environment going forward as well. Douglas, thank you very much indeed. Thanks to all of you for addressing those questions. Excellent questions. I'd love to have got more in. I'd love to have taken more time for them. But we, we now move to the closing remarks and let, let's keep those generic. We're talking, remember, again about the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, the voluntary sector, the role of the voluntary sector, the, the challenges it has faced, the challenges it will face uh, in, in the future. Let's get closing remarks in, in order, really succinct. And first we go to Patrick Harvey, please. Patrick, please. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that, that last discussion, I think, does give us some hope uh, that there is consensus about the kind and the scale of change that's needed in our society. But there are also fundamental disagreements about the, the type of change and the way to bring that about. Uh, I think if we're looking at COVID recovery, uh, if we're looking at making sure, ensuring that that's a green recovery, I think if we're looking at closing the chronic level of, of poverty and inequality in our society, uh, and if we're responding to the, the climate and nature emergency uh, in a way that actually ends the war against nature that is still being uh, perpetrated by humanity at the moment, we need to vote like our future depends on it. Because like never before, our future really does depend on the decisions that are going to be made by the se next session of the Scottish Parliament. So uh, if we're going to vote like our future depends on it, uh, I hope uh, that we'll uh, that we'll encourage people to vote green and get a good strong group uh, of green MSPs to continue making the positive impact for Scotland that we've made in the current session. Patrick Harvey, many Patrick Harvey, many thanks for that. I'm now delighted to welcome Willie Rennie from the Liberal Democrats. Willie, succinct closing remarks from you, please. Um, Brian, um, democracy can be a beautiful thing, and I think tonight is an example of that. That where all the leaders have come together, like on many occasions in this election campaign, and we can debate and discuss politely but robustly. And I think that's probably a feature of the Scottish elections, I think is something that we should cherish. I think we've heard tonight about mental health issues. We've heard tonight about the climate, the need for local communities to be strong and powerful. And I think we need to make sure in the next parliament, all those massive tasks, enormous tasks, need to be a resolute focus, needle sharp focus, to make sure we can tackle these enormous challenges as we come through the pandemic. And that's what we are arguing for in this election campaign to put recovery first, to make sure that we can come through this next period better than we started off. But most of all, Brian, I'm looking forward to you saying in conclusion of this debate tonight, and I haven't heard it for a while, to the <laughs> you. Just, just for you, Willie, we'll try and slip one in towards the close. Let's, let's, let's welcome Douglas Ross, please. Douglas, with your uh, closing remarks. Thanks, Brian. And, and you've asked us to be succinct, so I, I will please. simply pass on my, my thanks. Thanks to the SC, SCBO for organising this. Thanks to all the member organisations. I was checking the participants, and it hasn't automatically over the hour and a half we've all been discussing this. So there's clearly been interest there uh, from the audience and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And thanks for the questions. I think from the three questions, uh, we've seen uh, the issues that are important, the third sector, voluntary organisations, and that message has been heard loud and clear by the five leaders of the main political parties in Scotland. So you have uh, united us in terms of addressing your concerns, listening to your concerns, but we cannot do justice uh, to the issues facing voluntary organisations up and down Scotland in 90 minutes. This 
is a conversation and a dialogue that needs to continue well beyond tonight. Uh, and I certainly give that guarantee as leader of the Scottish Conservatives. We will continue this discussion, continue working for you and with you uh, over the course of the next Parliament as well. So thank Douglas, you. Douglas, thanks for that. I've chaired events where the most pointed question was, is that clock right? But tonight's been quite different. There have been excellent questions and an excellent discussion and discourse. Let's welcome Anna Sawar from the Labour Party. Anna, please. Again, I'll, I'll reiterate the thanks to you, Brian, and to the SCBO and to the 161 people that managed to keep it uh, online till, oh, till the very end. It's uh, very good of you all. Look, I think it's been a really important conversation and I, I want to say a, a special thank you, not just, um, I said flippantly about the debate, but actually a, a much bigger thank you is all the extraordinary efforts the voluntary sector has gone on pre-pandemic, but actually over the course of the pandemic, as well, and I sincerely mean that we we rightly applauded and thanked our frontline workers, and we thought mainly about NHS staff, social care staff, retail workers, police officers, and much in the round. But actually, all those frontline voluntary sector workers as well, they also deserve our applause and thanks as well, because you have genuinely gone above and beyond. So a, a sincere thank you to each and every single one of you. But our thanks isn't enough. We've got to make sure we invest in you and support you in the future as well, uh, and that's why through our focus on national recovery. We have got to see this work as a partnership. And if we are going to come through this pandemic with all the challenges that we've had throughout it and the challenges that are going to come from the aftermath, if we are going to come through this as a stronger and fairer nation, if we are going to come back in a way that we are going into the coming out of lockdown much stronger as a country than when we went into lockdown, then we have to see that as a partnership that's hand in glove with the voluntary sector. And you have that commitment from me that that is something that we want to make sure happens in terms of all our recovery plans over the course of the next five years of the Parliament. Let's do that together. And as many thanks. And finally, uh, a closing word from Nicola Sturgeon. Nicola, please. Thanks very much. I, I guess I just want to end tonight with a commitment to, but an open offer to the voluntary sector, uh, should I be First Minister after this election, which of course I don't uh, in any way take for granted. But I, I want to work with you uh, to turn what we've spoken about tonight into reality. I think we've made some progress towards this already, but over the next term of Parliament, I'd like to work with you to make a reality out of that aspiration for parity of esteem. So the voluntary sector sits at not as uh, some poor relation of the public sector or the private sector or, or government, but genuinely there at the table with parity of esteem, extending and expanding what you do. I'm genuinely keen to explore this voluntary sector first. When we've got a problem to tackle, let's ask ourselves first whether the voluntary sector is best placed to do that, galvanizing the assets um, and the resources in local communities. And both to support that, and I also think this will partly flow from that, to deliver that stability of funding, uh, to support it, that multi-year funding approach, uh, but flowing from that, if you're expanding what you do uh, with that parity of esteem, then the income that flows from that as well, enabling the sector to become more sustainable. So I think that's a big prize and allowing the voice of the voluntary sector to be heard. Um, and I think that is what we should aim for uh, to match the, the rhetoric and the aspirations that all of us have voiced this evening. So I'll end there just by reiterating the thanks of everybody else to the SCVO itself, but also to the wonderful, uh, rich, diverse uh, voluntary sector that we're blessed to have here in Scotland. Nicholas Sturgeon, thank you very much indeed. My thanks to the participants. We heard from you tonight. We heard from you. You all spoke well. Many, many thanks to you. Thanks to the audience. Above all, thanks to SCVO for facilitating this debate. Just for Willie, it's time for me to say Tulu the new and hand to Anna Fowley. Hi, uh, I just very quickly want to say thank you very much to, to all of you for a, a heated debate. And you'll be very pleased to know it's been trending on Twitter. And I could tell that some people were having a wee look at that. So that was much appreciated. Um, and thanks so much to, uh, to you, Brian, for hosting that in your inimitable style it's really made it makes it a, a hugely engaging event so i really appreciate all the commitments that you've made and um, the really positive words about the sector and for taking on some of the challenges and um, very much appreciate that um, and yeah people have stayed um, to throughout this so that's good um, i really appreciate that too so thank you to everybody um, and and good night thanks very much everyone thank you cheers